Chapter 10. The Cycle of Violence. Flying a meter above the ground, Palpatine's agile speeder skimmed over the plains below Thede Plateau, leaving long curving trails in the tall grasses. The day was bright and clear, the warm air abuzz with insects and strewn with pollen. Exhilarating, Plagueis said from the passenger side bucket seat when Palpatine's foot had eased off the accelerator. Maybe I'll become a professional racer. The Naboo might expect more of the eldest son of House Palpatine. I ignore the expectations of others, Palpatine said, without looking at him. Was the speeder a gift from your father? Palpatine glanced at him. A bribe, but one I accepted. Does he approve of your racing? Palpatine made a harsh sound. My father hasn't ridden with me for years. He doesn't know what he's missing. It has nothing to do with my talents. Palpatine turned slightly in the driver's seat. When I was younger, I was responsible for the deaths of two pedestrians. At the time, my father threatened never to allow me to fly, but he eventually relented. What made him change his mind? Palpatine swung forward. I wore him down. I'm sorry, Plagueis said. I didn't know. Although, in fact, he did know. With help from 114D, he had learned that Palpatine's troubled past had seen him bounced from one private school to the next, following incidents of petty crime and offenses that would have landed a commoner in a correctional facility. Time and again, his father, who shared with his son a pension for violence, had used his influence to rescue Palpatine and avoid the specter of family scandals. To Plagueis, however, the youth's transgressions were only further indication of his exceptionality. Here was a youth who had already risen above common morality and had judged himself unique enough to create an individual code of ethics. Palpatine pointed to the distant tree line. There are some ancient ruins in there, but that's Gungan territory. Have you had any dealings with them? Personally, no. But I've seen the ones that come into Moena to trade for goods. What are your thoughts about them? Aside from the fact that they are long-eared, slimy-tongued primitives? Aside from that, yes. Palpatine shrugged. I don't mind them so long as they keep to their submerged cities and waterways. Not get in the way? Exactly. Humans deserve to have the upper hand here. Plagueis could not restrain a smile. There are many worlds in the galaxy where the matter of who has the upper hand, as it were, is in dispute. That's because most beings are afraid to take charge. Think what the Republic Senate might accomplish under the leadership of a strong being. I have given thought to that, Palpatine. What does the Senate do in response to each and every crisis? It dispatches the Jedi to restore order and moves on without addressing the roots of the problem. Plagueis found the boy's youthful ignorance entertaining. The Jedi could rule the Republic if they wished, he said after a moment. I suppose we should be grateful that the Order is dedicated to peace. Palpatine shook his head. I don't view it like that. I think that the Jedi have dedicated themselves to limiting change. They wait for the Senate to tell them when and where to intervene and what to fix, when in fact they could use the Force to impose their will on the entire galaxy if they wanted. I'd have more respect for them if they did. Do you grant your father respects when he attempts to impose his will on you? Palpatine's grip on the steering yoke tightened. That's different. The reason I don't respect him is because he's not half as intelligent as he thinks he is. If he could admit to his weaknesses, I could at least pity him. Bringing the speeder to a sudden halt, he turned towards Plagueis once more, his face flushed with anger. Between them, dangling from the rearview mirror, was the coin Plagueis had given him. Before long, I will own this human, Plagueis told himself. House Palpatine is wealthy, the youth went on, but not nearly as wealthy as some of the other houses, and not nearly as influential with the king and the electorate, despite my father's attempts to take a leadership position with the royals. 
He lacks the political acumen needed to elevate our house to a position of true entitlement, and along, uh, and along with it, the awareness to recognize that the time has come for Naboo to exploit its matchless resources and join the modern galaxy. Instead, he and his cronies, in complete and utter political ineptitude, want to keep us caged in the past. Does your mother share his views? Palpatine forced a laugh. Only because she espouses no views of her own. Only because he has made her subservient to him. And he has my well-behaved brothers and sisters who treat me like an interloper and yet, to my father, represent all I can never be. Plagueis considered the remarks in silence. And yet you honor your house by going by its name. Palpatine's expression softened. For a time I thought about adopting the name of our distaff line. I haven't rejected the dynasty I was born into. I've rejected the name I was given. But not for the grandiose reasons some think. Just the opposite, actually. I'm certain that you, of all beings, understand as much. There it was again, Plagueis thought. The deceptive cadence, the use of flattery, charm, and self-effacement as the rapier faints in a duel. The need to be seen as guileless, unassuming, empathetic. A youth with no desire to enter politics and yet born for it. Tenebris had told him from the start that the Republic, with health from the Sith, would continue to descend into corruption and disorder and that a time would come when it would have to rely on the strengths of an enlightened leader, capable of saving the lesser masses from being ruled by their unruly passions, jealousies, and desires. In the face of a common enemy, real or manufactured, they would set aside all their differences and embrace the leadership of anyone who promised a brighter future. Could this Palpatine, with Plagueis' help, be the one to bring about such a transformation? Again, he tried to see deeper into Palpatine, but without success. The psychic walls the youth had raised were impenetrable, which made the young human something rare indeed. Had Palpatine somehow learned to corral the force within himself, as Plagueis had concealed his own powers as a youth? Of course I understand, he said finally. But when you were young, did you question your motivations, especially when they ran counter to everyone else's? Plagueis held his challenging gaze. I never asked why this or why that. What if this or what if that? I simply responded to my own determination. Palpatine sat back in the speeder seat as if a great weight had been lifted from him. Some of us are required to do what others cannot, Plagueis added in a conspiratorial way. Without a word, Palpatine nodded. Plagueis had no need to delve any further into whatever traumas had given rise to Palpatine's cunning, secretive nature. He simply needed to know, does this young human have the Force? Two standard days later, on Malastair, a world of varied terrain that occupied a prime position on the Hydean Way, even the deafening clatter and nauseating odor of speeding pod racers wasn't enough to distract Plagueis from thinking about Palpatine. Damask Holdings had requested a meeting with Senator Pax Teen, and the leader of the Grand Protectorate had provided the Munes with box seats for the Phobos Memorial Run. They had arrived directly from Naboo in the ex uh, expectation of discussing business matters, but the Grand, Dugs, Zisharians, and nearly everyone else in the city of Pixelito were more interested in sport and betting. Have you picked a winner, Magister? Pax team asked after two pod racers ripped past the viewing stands. Lost in his thoughts about Naboo, Plega said, I believe I have. His conversations with Palpatine seemed to have opened some sort of emotional floodgates in the human. The Munes had scarcely left Naboo behind when the first of several hollow communiques were received from Palpatine regarding the royal's latest plans for undermining Bon Topalo's bid for the monarchy. Plagueis had listened attentively, but, in fact, Palpatine had precious little to offer. Since the release of the information about the royal's actions during the Gungan conflict, Palpatine's father had been conducting his meetings behind closed doors at the family estate, and had forbidden his son from so much as discussing the coming election. Topalo's campaign, by contrast, was on the upswing, as a result of having announced a pending deal with the intergalactic banking clan. 
the urgency of Palpatine's transmission suggested that he had formed an attachment to Plagueis and was reaching out to him not only as a secret employer, but also as a potential advisor. In Higo Damask, Palpatine saw the wealth and power he had long sought for House Palpatine. Confident that this young human would continue to be useful long after Damask Holdings' plans for Naboo had been realized, Plagueis did nothing to discourage the attachment. Why is it that we never see humans competing in the races, he asked team after a moment. The Grand waved his six-fingered hand in dismissal. They haven't the talent for it. The favorite to win today is the dug at the controls of the Blue Racer. Plagueis tracked the Pod Racer for a moment. In the stands below him, thousands of dugs, standing on all four appendages, on hind legs or supported on arms only, were barking encouragement. Plagueis found Malastare's high gravity oppressive, and the Grand more so. They had arrived on the planet a thousand years earlier as colonists and had proceeded to beat the native dugs into submission. The Protectorate had since grown to overshadow the Grand homeworld, Kinyan, and was a powerful force within the Republic Senate, with wide-ranging influence in the Mid and Outer Rims. Seated alongside Plagueis, Larsh Hill leaned forward to address Pax's team. Perhaps Gardula will be able to entice humans to pilot pod racers in the course she is refurbishing on Tatooine. Team honked in irritation. So it's true. You support the hut. It's simply business, Hill said. But Team was not appeased. Is this the purpose of your visit? To reopen wounds that have not yet healed? Yes, Plagueis said flatly. Team's trio of eye stalks swung to him. I don't... Don't compound the offense, Hill interrupted. Team feigned in comprehension. From who did you learn of our interests on Naboo? Plagueis asked. The Grand looked to his comrades, but found no support in their abrupt silence. From whom? Plagueis repeated. A low of resignation escaped Team. We were approached by Subtex Mining, following the unexplained disappearance of some of its members. The ones I encountered on Sojourn, I suspect. They were in fine health when they left the gathering, Hill said. Team nodded. I'm certain they were. Why did Subtext approach you, Plagueis said. Team hesitated, then said, To inform us that you were involved in a deal for the plasma. Trusting that you would try to subvert our efforts by making them public, Hill said. The Grand snorted. First you strike a deal with Gardula that favors Tatooine over Malastare, and now Naboo's plasma captures your attention, despite your offer to increase the cost of Malastare's energy exports. So why shouldn't we have alerted your opponents on Naboo when you would have done the same? Plagueis waited for him to finish, and for a group of pod racers to pass. Then he fixed his gaze on the assembled Gran. You harm yourselves by attempting to sabotage us. The Protectorate could have prof profited from Naboo, as the Trade Federation will. But no longer. Pax Team's huge feet slapped the floor of the private box. We refuse to be demeaned. Again I remind you, Magister, that promises were made. Plagueis smiled inwardly. It was true that Tenebris had had plans for the Gran. At one time, Pax's team had put, been put forth as someone the Sith could move into the Chancellorship and manipulate from a distance into making mistakes that would bring the Republic to its knees. But Plagueis had now begun to explore other options. We are not without allies and cronies in the Senate, team was saying in a huff. We can crush any legislation you wish to see passed, or arrange for your bills and no-bid contracts to languish in procedure for years. We'll put one of our own into the Chancellorship. We'll deny the Trade Federation shipping rights on Kinyon and along the Trade Spine. We'll turn the duds loose on the Munes. He glared at Plagueis. You'll never get what you want, Magister. On the contrary, Plagueis said, as he and the other Munes were rising. I already have what I want. A rousing cheer went up from the stands as a toon pilot overtook the favored Doug. Plagueis turned to Hill as they were exiting the private box. 
Order the sun guard to retrieve the miners we marooned in the Tingle Arm. Execute them, and have their bodies dumped at the gates of Subtex Mining's corporate headquarters on Corellia. A freshly minted capital class starship returned Plagueis and Hill to Naboo. Manufactured by Horsch Kessel and Gwori, the vessel was shaped like an elongated pod with a flat underbelly. A lateral wing transected the convex hull aft in which were housed arrays of powerful hyperwave transceivers. On board, along with the chief executives of Damask Holdings, were several high ranking members of the banking clan, including the nephew of Chairman Tonneth all of them dressed in full IBC regalia. A month had passed since Plagueis' initial visit, and in the interim, he and Palpatine had spoken by hollow on many occasions. The intelligence the human provided, though scant, had allowed Plagueis and Hill to keep one step ahead of Bon Topalo's detractors, and as a result, he continued to enjoy a slight margin with the electorate. The Mune groups were approaching Naboo's spaceport immigration stations when they were inter inter intercepted by a contingent of armed security personnel, wearing leather jerkins, tall boots, and brimmed hats. Ushered into a glass-walled holding area equipped with not much more than benches and refresher units, the Munes waited for over an hour until two palace guards entered, demanding to know which of them was Higo Damask. After identifying himself and assuring Larsh Hill that he needn't worry, Plagueis followed the guards outside the terminal to a waiting round-nosed Gian speeder. A uniformed guard seated at the controls ordered Plagueis into the open top speeder's rear bench seat, where one of the escort personnel joined him. He didn't have a clue as to where he was being taken, but refused to give the guards the satisfaction of telling him that he would soon find out, or words to that effect. Instead, he sat silently in the cushioned seat, careful not to register even the slightest surprise when the pilot began to steer the speeder away from Theed and out across the rolling verdant terrain Palpatine had taken him through. You may as well make yourself comfortable, his seatmate said at last. We'll be traveling for about two hours. Plagueis nodded in response and allowed himself to drift into a light trance, in preparation for whatever lay in wait for him at their destination. Gradually, the undulating plains began to rise, and a ridge of mountains came into view, limbed against Naboo's brilliant blue sky. The speeder followed a broad river valley until hills lush with foliage, where herds of short-limbed shacks grazed and frolicked. As the speeder gained altitude, the river narrowed and quickened, fed by waterfalls and crystalline lakes. Pure white clouds were beginning to form at the summits of the higher peaks when the speeder slewed across a vast stretch of meadow and came to a halt in front of a majestic home built in the style of Theed's fat domes and graceful towers. Two of the guards led him up a wide flight of stone stairs into a cool and dimly lighted foyer. Abandoned there, Plagueis wandered past wall hangings and plinth statuary to the opposite end of the foyer, where round-topped floor-to-ceiling windows overlooked a veranda and a large lake beyond. Seated at a table were an aristocratic-looking female human of middle age and a sulking male youth of Palpatine's age or younger, engaged in what appeared to be serious conversation. Touched by a breeze coming down off the slopes of the mountains, the surface of the water sparkled like Megiddo gemstones. As Plagueis turned his back to the lake, his attention was drawn to a tapestry depicting the same family crest he observed on the pockets of Palpatine's jacket and featuring a trio of creatures. Virmok, Iwa, and Zalaka. He became aware of someone approaching him from behind, but didn't budge. Beautiful work, isn't it? A baso-voiced human said in basic. Plagueis turned to find a tall man of patrician bearing standing at the threshold to the larger room. As is the view, Plagueis said, gesturing broadly towards the lake. Dressed casually, though in fine taste, the silver-haired man advanced into the foyer. I'm so glad you decided to accept my invitation to visit, Magister Damask. The presence of armed guards suggested an absence of choice, Consignor Palpatine. They were for your protection, Magister. I never thought of Naboo as a dangerous world. For some it is, the elder Palpatine said. But now that you are here... Allow me to show you around. The tour took them through a dozen rooms adorned with plush carpets and works of art. 
stonework predominated, but the furniture was constructed of the galaxy's most prized hardwoods. By the time they stepped down onto the veranda, the, women and the, uh, the woman and the youth were nowhere to be seen, but the breeze had picked up and a storm was threatening. Concerned uh, Palpatine indicated an island in the distance and the stately house that rose from the shore. That is very Kido, he explained. A prize of the lake country, once owned by the poet Omar Barenko and presently occupied by the Dumberi family. He glanced at Plagueis. Are you perhaps familiar with Barenko's masterwork, The Defense of Naboo? Sadly, no. I'll arrange for you to be provided with a translation. A copy of the original text would be fine. I'm fluent in your language. Testing him, Consignia Palpatine switched to Naboo to say, Yes, I understand you've become quite the expert on Naboo politics. Before Plagueis could respond, he waved his hand in front of a censor that summoned three servants onto the veranda, each bearing trays of food and drink. Plagueis exhaled in a fatigued way. More food, he thought. More olfactory stimulation for human noses. They sat opposite each other at the same table the woman and youth had occupied earlier, and remained silent while the servants laid out the repast. Fresh fruits, vegetables, and farinaceous dishes, Palpatine said, indicating the spread. No shack or other meats. Plagueis forced a smile. Perhaps you'll take up a study of the Muin language next. His host frowned, then sat back in his chair to allow the servants to heap food on his plate. He didn't begin eating until the servants had exited, and stopped after only a few mouthfuls and set his utensils down with finality. Let me tell you a short story about Bon Tapalo and Ars Veruna, he began, glowering at Plagueis. Seventy years ago, some two decades after our own conflict with them, the Gungans found themselves embroiled in a war for survival with a mercenary army. Fortunately, the Gungans prevailed, though not without many deaths and the loss of some of their swamp cities. Very little was ever made public regarding the cause of the war or the source of the mercenaries, but I'm willing to let you in on one of Naboo's darker secrets, in the hopes that you'll learn something from it. The reason for the war was plasma, and the houses that contributed most to funding the mercenary army were House Topalo and House Veruda. When my grandfather learned of this, he challenged Topalo's father to a duel of honor, and eventually succumbed to the injuries Topalo's blade inflicted. He gestured to a lawn that bordered the veranda. The duel took place just there. Plagueis glanced at the spot. How utterly romantic. And human. Consignia Palpatine's handsome face took on color. Perhaps you fail to grasp the point of the story, Magister. Tapalo, Veruda, and the rest of that group of thugs are interested only in power and wealth, at whatever cost to Naboo. The discovery of a plasma reservoir below Theed was the worst thing that could have happened, and now they mean to exploit it for all it's worth, with the aid of influential beings like yourself. This is why Tapalo must never be king. Plagueis pretended to consider it, then said, It would appear that the electorate disagrees with you. Palpatine nodded. For now, yes. But we have plans for bringing the electorate back into line, beginning with an announcement that the deal Topalo struck with the banking clan has fallen through. I wasn't aware that it had, Plagueis said evenly. Palpatine became angrier as he spoke. Why do you think we stopped your party from entering Theed? We still wield enough power to keep you from setting foot on Naboo. And you may as well hear the rest of it, Magister. The Republic Senate has been apprised of Mutalists' attempt to meddle with and destabilize the sovereignty of our world. When Plagueis didn't respond, he added, The Naboo have a legend about six impenetrable gates that hold back chaos. House Palpatine is one of those gates to mask. And we Munes represent chaos, Plagueis said, without making it sound like a question. Palpatine leaned forward and spoke in a calmer voice. We are not opposed to having Naboo join the galactic community when the time is right. But not now, and not like this. 
To Paolo's promise of tax cuts and trade with the core, those are the very tactics the Republic deploys to seduce primitive worlds into surrendering their resources. He shook his head as anger took hold of him once more. The Naboo admire philosophers, not bankers and deal brokers. Tapalo's election to the throne would lead to catastrophe. The defense of Naboo, Plagueis said. The poem you mentioned. What about it? Whatever became of the author, Barenko? Consignia Palpatine's eyes narrowed to slits. He was abducted by assailants and never found. He rose halfway out of his chair to add, Are you threatening me? Here, in my own house? Plagueis made a placating gesture. I thought we were discussing history. I only meant to ask what might happen if you were unsuccessful in restraining chaos and Tapalo wins despite your best efforts. I've already told you that that will not happen, and here is why. Because you're going to tell your friends in the banking clan and the trade federation that you've lost interest in Naboo. That you've found better company among the huts, slavers, and spice runners of the Outer Rim. He paused momentarily. You're a very long way from Munalist, Magister Damask. I strongly suggest that you reboard your ship and leave the Chamal sector as quickly and as quietly as possible, lest anyone fall victim to an untoward event. Plagueis stared at the lake. I take your meaning, Consignor Palpatine, he said, without looking at him. And one more thing, Palpatine said, emboldened. I don't know precisely why you've taken such a keen interest in my son, or he in you, but you're to have no further dealings with him. Plagueis turned to him. Your son has great potential. Potential I don't wish to see despoiled by your kind. We're moving him out of your reach, in any case. I'd been given to believe that the Naboo were an open people. But then, the Gungans probably wouldn't agree either. Palpatine stood up sharply. Enough of this. Guard, he said. And when three of them hurried in, get him out of my sight. And that's the end of the chapter. Hope you enjoyed it. Talk to you soon.